So we're going to start by going around and introducing ourselves. And so that people on the recording can hear, we want to use the microphones. There's a number of them uh, around the room. And we're going to start right back here with Sharon. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh wait, wait, wait. I, I, I always forget to do this. My name is Tom Darenthal. I, I always forget to introduce myself. And I need a microphone. And I, I live on Nash Place. I'm part of the steering committee. And um, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sharon Busher, and I live on East Avenue. Hi, I'm Dave Colley. I live on Nash Place, part of the old East End. Richard Hilliard, High Grove Court, Ward 1. Uh, Chris Hazley, Ward 3, candidate for mayor. I, I will be brief. I'll just simply say that for the first time in over 40 years, Burlington has returned to a two-party system, and we've seen where that's gotten us. There's been a lot of division here. Uh, as an observer on the outside, I've seen a lot of good ideas come from both progressives and the Democrats, and I think uh, one of the reasons that an independent would do well is because we can reach across the aisle and really try to bring out the best of both sides. That's my goal. Um, I won't sit here and take up any more time. I think most of you know who I am and know where to find me, but uh, I'd like to try to focus on bringing the city together because I think it's long overdue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Will. Uh, I used to live in Ward 1 uh, on Salmon Run. Um, I actually did an interview down there today with a gentleman named Merjan, Abdi uh, Merjan Amir. And, uh, you know, we were talking about water infrastructure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, that's next? Okay, my name is William Emmons, candidate for mayor. Uh, Will for BTV.com. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm um, Jason Stuffel, uh, Colchester Ave. I'm part of the Old East End Neighborhood Coalition, and I'm also the Burlington Walk Bike Council rep for the Winooski Bridge Project. So any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. Hi. It, it, sorry. I'm enjoying this amazing lasagna. I'm reluctant to give it up. Uh, I'm Tim Doherty. I live in the bright blue house on Colonial Square that used to have chickens. Uh, I'm Sam, and I live with Tim. He's my dad. Michael Long, I live in Henry Street. Karen Long, Henry Street. I got another mic here, Karen. Oh, sorry. Um, Carter Newbuser, I'm running for city council in Ward 1. Um, I'm going to have to, I'm going to stay for a speak out and then run, but I just left, uh, there's a sheet that the city's distributing for resources on who to call for different public safety questions. I think we've been trying to get that out uh, to folks, so just left it on the front there. Kathy Alwell, I live on South, uh, North Prospect Street. <laughs> I'm Angie Chapel Sokol. I also live on North Prospect Street. Hello, I'm Julie, and I also live on North Prospect Street. I'm going to avoid the uh, column here. Uh, Jeff Hand, I live on Henry Street. I'm also running for city council here in Ward 1. Thank you. Julia Lynham, and I live on North Street. Hi, I'm Carol Livingston, and I live on uh, Calarco Court. I'm also on the steering committee, along with Sam and J Jonathan and Carter and Tom. Um, I also just would urge people, if you haven't had a chance to sign in, if you could do that for us, that would be great. Thank you. I'm Fletcher Pratt, and I live on Riverside Ave, down by the car wash. I'm Cindy Wolk, and I live on Brooks Ave. Sydney Monka, I live on um, Grove Street. Earhart Monka, Grove Street. Nice to see everybody. Uh, Gary Golden, I'm the school board commissioner for uh, East District, and I'm over on Calarco Court. Hi, I'm Troy Hedrick. I live on uh, Ability Court. I'm also one of the reps for Chinden 15, which includes all of Ward 1. I'm Catherine Verman. I live on North Street. <coughs> Peter Lukowski. I live in Burlington Co-Housing on East Avenue. <coughs> Cheryl Green, Burlington Co-Housing, East Avenue. 
uh, Aaron Lukowski. I'm just visiting them at Go Housing. <laughs> Gene Keller, Billado Parkway. Get it? I get two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Joel Collada, 20 Chase Street. We have the Planet Earth flag. I'm with the Vermont State Walking College. Uh, Samantha Ayat on Chase Street, part of the steering committee and also part of the Old East End. And I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. I'm on the steering committee. I live on North Prospect Street. And that's it. Pasco, we got people online? Yeah. What? Uh, can, we, can, we, can we see their names? Sophie. Sophie, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Sophie, do you want to introduce yourself? Jean? Okay, and Deb? Hi, Deb. <laughs> okay, and I can't read. I think there's a Lisa. Lisa? Okay, um, did we get Lynn? I don't know. If yeah. Milo? Hi, Milo. This is city councilor. And I'm so sad I'm not there for the lasagna tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you leftovers. And Cyril. I'm mute to speak. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> part of uh, Ward 1 of um, East Ad Particle Housing. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. And we've got a jam packed agenda tonight. Um, but we're going to shift gears quickly and go to speak out. And. Um, I thought I had something written down here. I didn't. So, Jonathan, you have some speak out stuff. I have announcements. You have announcements. Are we, are we, are yeah. we doing announcements? Announcements and speak out. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. I'm on the steering committee, but you know that because I just told you before. A little louder, please. Um, <clears throat> oh, crap. <laughs> We're going to have right. to do circles. Hi. Um, I have three things, and I'm going to forget the third, and Tom's going to remind me. The first is we vote, th th these are all procedural, okay? We vote on steering committee in March. So we ha there are currently five members of the steering committee, and I know that at least four of us would like to continue to be on the steering committee. One of us may not be allowed to be on the steering committee, depending on the outcome of the election. That's Carter. Um, there are, uh, according to our bylaws, we can have up to seven members of the steering committee. We would love to have seven members in the steering committee. So assume that there will be a slate that will come next, um, next month that will have at least four of us on it, uh, same four as now. And anybody else who's interested, we'd love to hear from you. You can nominate yourself on the floor, or somebody else can nominate you, or you can join the slate, or however you want to do it. But we'd love participation. That's one. Two. Major questions. Major questions. Yes. The city, no, NPA and city agreement. Oh, resolution. So we've talked about a resolution, an NPA resolution that we want to bring to the city council, um, asking the city council to write a resolution that, um, that will work on developing a, a, a clear relationship between the NPAs and the city council and a process by which the city council decides what issues are the most important that need to be referred to an NPA to get public input before, um, before it gets voted on. 
part of this is a result, you may recall, that uh, a few months ago we asked for 45 days on the MOU, that we wanted to make sure the MOU was not voted on until everybody had a chance to, uh, to talk about it at an NPA. Um, so that's the beginning of it, but we will, um, we will vote on this next month. We'll talk about it and vote on it. We did post it in Front Porch Forum about a month ago, so everybody should have seen it at least once. We'll post it again. Uh, that's two. Three is? Bylaws. Bylaws. <laughs> so we have a set of bylaws. We passed them a couple years ago. Um, the city would like us to add a certain number of mandatory items that all, that is basically a standard across all NPAs that we all have certain things that are required to be in our bylaws. We don't want to bother the NPA until we know exactly what they are. There's a link to them on a city page, and we can describe them so that, so that it's absolutely clear and everybody has the same information. So we're not going to talk about bylaws until, this, until CETO comes back with, a, um, with some, some very clear things. And the, the things that, the things are, they're, you know, it's good stuff. It's, it's um, uh, a grievance process. It's making sure we have clear non-discrimination policies. So it's good stuff. We just want to make sure that it's absolutely clear what it is before we put mandatory things into our bylaws. That's it, right? That's it. Thank you. So what are the responsibilities of a steering committee member? Oh. What do they do if they get involved in the steering committee? Um, what do we do? Uh, basically, we plan, <laughs> bas basically we, uh, most important is to plan, an ag plan agendas. We have gotten permission in the past to spend money. Um, and typically, we spend money. This. NPA spends almost all their money right here in this room. It's either on food, rental, um, really basics. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what we're doing. As a matter of fact, um, probably ne maybe next month we'll talk about instead of bringing disposable plastic bottles of water, maybe we should buy a thermos or two um, so that we can, <laughs> we can recycle everything. Um, that's largely what it is. We can post, it would be a good idea to post what our bylaws say exactly. But it's to meet regularly, plan, and plan agendas. And yeah, and I'll just add, um, just uh, with the help of CEDO and FOSCA, we are able to reach out to other um, organizations throughout the city and uh, city councilors and you know mayoral candidates and other people and have them come here for our um, for our MPA meetings. So we have a lot of um, a lot of time spent with networking and connecting with other people and other organizations within the city as well. Um, I wanted to add, um, which I haven't talked to you guys about this or not. Um, I had gone to um, CEDO held a uh, non discrimination and like conflict resolution training, and I just wanted to. Um, kind of give some uh, feedback to everybody and just uh, just also make it clear that this is a place that is welcoming to everybody and if anybody does feel unsafe to please let us know um, we try to make this as welcoming as possible and hope hopefully we do a pretty good job um, and um, yeah that's kind of that's it just hope everybody feels safe and welcome Okay, thanks. Um, we have other people that would like to speak. Will. Hi, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name the is... The mic is only for the people that are not here. <laughs> okay. So you got to speak loud enough. Uh, okay, people. okay. My name is Will, and, uh, you know, I, I used to live in Ward 1. I was in Salmon Run. And uh, I actually went down there today. I was knocking on doors in Ward 1 uh, asking for votes. And, um, you know, I, I bumped into a person named Merjan Amir, uh, and he's uh, part of the Somali Bantu Association of Vermont. And we were talking about uh, something that happened when I was a kid. I went and worked on a horse farm in Maryland. And uh, I you know, just wanted to talk about water infrastructure for a minute. You see, this guy's name was Ken Wood, and he was, uh, he was actually featured on the Today Show. And uh, they did a longer documentary that I put on my website, which is willforbtv.com. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he found out that there was people dying of contamination of, in Africa, uh, specifically, I believe, Uganda and Tanzania. So he took his well drilling company over there. And this is one man with a team of people uh, on his own dime, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and started drilling wells. And uh, they drilled over 1,100 wells in, uh, in the end. And uh, I, I think 
think it's it's actually much more than that, but I don't want to quote that. Um, but in any case, it saved over 100,000 lives. And uh, I think I think the point that I'm making is that if one person can do this, uh, you know, to, to build that much infrastructure and save that many lives, I think that um, Burlington has a lot to be desired with our water infrastructure. And where we, we, we I'm constantly hearing that it's not possible to fix this. I think living in Salmon Run, you smell the updrift from the uh, from the sewage plant. And uh, I think that it's something that can be can be fixed. I think that our, our water infrastructure could be much better. And I think that we don't need to be the biggest polluters of the lake. And I also think that, you know, if you dream, it's it's all possible. And, and to, you know, to work towards that goal, you know, I, I think it's time for change in Burlington. I know Chris said that earlier. You know, I'm, I'm going house to house asking for votes. I think me and Chris are both locked out of tomorrow night's debates. And I would like to see um, the citizens of Burlington really vote for change in this election. You owe nobody your vote. And um, as a long time, union representative I've done a lot of work on behalf of people and I and I know Chris is passionate as well so uh, thank you guys for your time and and I and thank you for having us here thanks other speakers I'm just gonna say there's a couple people who entered the room after introduction if they wanted to but you're you've got the floor okay um, can you Oops. how much time do I have not much. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll leave. I'll leave some copies then. Um, I'm here to talk about the uh, UVMMC MOU. Is it? Is the medical there, center. Yeah. We, that's actually on the agenda. That's and on the Q&A agenda. Q&A time at that point. So would it make sense to have it in the context well, of the conversation? Well, actually, I'm. I've been to meetings, I've read it. I, I don't have any more questions about it. I have, I want to give a message about what I would like people to be looking for when they hear the message okay. from UVM. Um, the first thing is the dismantling of the old parking garage on Colchester Avenue isn't merely because it's falling down, it's because they want that land to build something larger and taller. Instead, a multi-story garage will be built on top of some of the existing surface parking elsewhere. But keep an eye on the vacant space that's opened up by getting rid of that parking garage. Second, they're requesting an increased height limit on the existing overlay regulating the current main body of the hospital. In other words, when you look up, you look up at the hill, they're asking for a height overlay to go an additional 40 feet up, which means that those buildings would be taller than the water tower. That's what they told us. They also intend to tear down Patrick and Shepherdson North. This frees up a large block of land, some of it now open, abutting the main campus. And the drawings show they intend to build this tower right up to the Mary Fletcher Drive. In other words, they will fill that space with another building 580 feet high. They are also requesting that the campus overlay be extended to cover the area freed up by the removal of the parking garage, which is not now in the campus overlay. So the area between Mary Fletcher Drive, which is the, you know, the one that wraps around and comes to the, the entrance, the side entrance, um, from that space, from, from the s north end of that to Colchester Avenue, they want that under the overlay, which is also 580 feet above sea level. And they want to build into the buffer zone that now goes all the way around the campus. They want to build this new building over the, where the parking garage was, right up to the sidewalk, 580 feet high. Um, so facing Colchester Avenue? Yeah. Right on that sidewalk on Colchester Avenue, yeah. Because they're taking the parking garage out, and they're going to build a building that will go from Mary Fletcher Drive down to Colchester Avenue. And they say that the current MOU allows them to intrude into the buffer zone without exceeding the limit. And I think that's a very important thing. Um, if we don't get the limit changed in the new MOU, they would be allowed to intrude into the buffer zone that much under the current MOU. Um, finally, and this is, I think, a very, the, the parking thing is, I can't even get in, there's no time to get into the, they're going to add 800 new parking spaces. And these aren't spaces, just 800 cars. These are people coming in and out all day to 800 spaces. How any of us are going to get out 
around on East Avenue is just unfathomable to me. And finally, for those like Sharon who worked so hard for the neighborhood amenities, there is a line in here that says if they don't get their zoning approvals by date certain, the whole MOU is null and void as far as they're concerned. The whole thing, not just the zoning stuff they're asking for. And finally, what, what is in this MOU for us? Why is this being rushed? The council members and citizens are in the throes of elections, and this is our last chance for leverage to make sure the document is fair-handed. Um, there are a lot of trapdoors in this thing, a lot of trapdoors, and it needs more attention than we're be being given the time for, just like the UVM, just like the F-35s. It would be wonderful if this could be put off it's not going to expire until the end of 2024. So part of your message is really listen carefully to what we're going to hear later. Read between the lines, read under the lines, read around the lines. Okay. They are not going to tell you what's really happening. That's I've been fighting them since 1984. Thank you. Thank you. Here's some okay. copies. What was your name? Jean Keller. Jean Keller, Billado Parkway. <coughs> Billado Parkway. Off right. of East. Other Chris. On a similar note, a uh, similar project, Memorial Auditorium, letter of intent very clearly states that it is binding and that it uh, basically gives one developer sole exclusive access to talk about the gateway block. And we had a public process, I think it was 2018, to talk specifically about Memorial Auditorium, but I'm not sure it makes sense from a process point of view to move down the path. Uh, without soliciting, you know, alternate uh, proposals for the gateway block, and I'm not sure why we're trying to push everything through in the, uh, you know, coming to the end of the current mayor's term. But I think that this is another area that needs to be looked at very seriously, and um, maybe put the brakes on this one too. It's not a very, been a very transparent process, and uh, I think we need to have more transparency. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to, two things. One, um, I know we're going to discuss a, really, a bunch of really important stuff. I do need to head out because I haven't been home yet, and it's Valentine's Day, and I promised Sophia we'd have dinner. Um, so I swear <laughs> I will watch this meeting. Um, I sent along a list of questions, and I also forwarded uh, Paul Bierman over on Brooks Ave, wrote an op-ed um, in VT Digger about uh, neighborhood code, and I know that we're going to discuss that tonight. Um, but I sent that, those questions around and concerns around uh, that I heard from folks at the door to my fellow steering committee members and to uh, Megan as well. Um, so I'm hoping that those questions are answered and I'm happy to share that out with folks um, if folks are curious. But I'm hoping that some of those are addressed mainly. Um, one, why, at least as I perceive it, particular areas of the city are being upzoned while wealthier parts of the city are not being upzoned, for example, the hill section, um, and just you know, mainly wanting to make sure that we're taking into account and uh, understanding the impacts on built infrastructure, and also having more public process because we're in the middle of an election cycle and we ought to have more time because it's clear when I go around that folks uh, aren't fully comfortable with all the details and, and want to have more conversation before we move forward. But sorry to Thanks. jut out. Sure. Hi. Um, so never in my, I've lived here since um, the mid-60s. I came here to go to UVM, and, um, and I lived on campus, <laughs> one of those rare students that did for four years. But anyways, um, and then came and worked at the hospital for 50 years and have always lived, except when I was on campus in Ward 6, I've always lived in Ward 1. Um, either as a renter or a homeowner. And um, never in my experience have I seen so many really critical, important issues try to move through the city council in such a short period of time. And I feel that this is detrimental to the residents of Burlington and detrimental to each item that is trying to be 
rushed through. Each one of them is deserving of more attention and more time. More attention and time by staff that are divided and have to work uh, simultaneously on really key issues for the city. And certainly for residents who are doing their best to try to give constructive and positive or critical input about what's good and what isn't good. I don't feel, I mean, I feel that the administration is ultimately responsible, and if they're not, that they should set that record straight. But I am frustrated, just like so many in this room, feeling like we are doing the best we can to respond and give feedback to the people that represent us now and, the, and those who might represent us in the future. And, um, and I, I, I want this to stop. I want everyone to take a breath and really do what's right for Burlington because Burlington's going to get screwed out of this and the residents who choose to remain. Thank you. Tom, Tom. What? Tom. Oscar. Um, hi everyone, I'm Fosca, I'm the NPA Public Engagement Specialist with CEDO, so I'm at all these meetings. Um, I'm here tonight to just share a quick announcement on behalf of some colleagues um, who work on housing. If you haven't heard, there is the Consolidated Plan Survey that's going out. Um, so basically every five years the City of Burlington creates a plan for housing and community development priorities. The plan will direct how the city uses federal funds it receives from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The plan includes information about Burlington's demographics, housing, economy, strengths, and needs. So basically there's a survey that um, they're trying to pass around to understand what uh, Burlington residents think are the city's greatest challenges and, and where to apply that funding. So there is a QR code on here. I'll pass around a few copies if you'd like to scan it to do it online. If not, I also have some paper copies. Thank you, Charlie. Um, and basically, you get six dots, and you can put them wherever you think uh, the city should, should prioritize resources. You could put six on, on one topic or, or divide them out. Um, it's pretty quick, so I'll leave these around, too, if people would like to fill it out. Thanks. Thanks. And can I do my speak out, Tom? In a second. Um, you're going to queue up some pictures for us? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to queue up some pictures. Okay. But right now, Jake is going to thank you as a speak out. Sharon, I uh, texted your landline, so you didn't get it on Monday night, but... <laughs> During your comments at city council meeting, I was going like this. <laughs> because I wholeheartedly agree, and um, Fosca, I appreciate what you just said, but we, the people of Burlington, are so used to those things, and we are so used to these inclusive processes and putting in dots. I remember Moreau's first public meeting after he became mayor 12 years ago, where he did dots on paper, and... And I'm just so disenchanted with that process because I associate it with Moreau not listening to people after asking for their opinions. So I hope that that's a different process and I hope people engage with it. Yeah, I'm not speaking against that. It just was a little triggering for me. Um, so what I wanted to talk about and speak out tonight is my little public service announcement. We haven't had a new mayor in 12 years. Um, this is a really transformative time for Burlington I've been involved in some city council campaigns, uh, one mayoral campaign, um, a lot of citizen-led campaigns for other things. Um, and I've talked to a lot of people who tell me why they like Joan, why they like Emma, why they don't like Joan, why they don't like Emma. And a lot of people are giving me reasons um, that are factually incorrect. So what I just want to say as my PSA is please, Please go into this election cycle with an open heart and mind and learn all you can about all the candidates on the ballot for every single race and make a very informed decision. Um, I think that there's a lot of, uh, who is it, uh, Franklin, I think, one of the framers, had, had some quotes about a uh, well-informed electorate is the bedrock of democracy, something to that extent. Um, also, <laughs> remember our voters' oath. We have a voter's oath in Vermont, which is very unique. 
and it really just drives home the point that you cannot go into that booth as an individualist. You really got to consider what is the best thing for the whole community, not what is the best thing for you. So please learn and uh, don't vote along party lines because we're above that around here. Thanks. All right. We have got we have any other speak out issues? Well, uh, one yes. quick thing Sarah. to add to well, Sharon and Chris. With the gateway block, what came up at the last uh, city council meeting was that the agreement that I guess the councilors signed in November is it was a no bid contract. And in the state of Vermont, and with this, we were supposed to get bids for Memorial Auditorium, the whole gateway block. So this is something I'm not sure if it's going to be on hold now. That's what it seems like we need to look into that. But that's what the noise was about at the city council meeting, from my understanding, that we instead entered an agreement with two developers, two local developers. It will be housing and a hotel. We are going to have two hotels now at City Place, so I don't, you know, anyway, that's what that's about. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Jason, you have got some pictures of wildlife you took. Yep. Yep. Are you near your house or in Centennial Woods? Or no, these are directly on my own property. Um, okay. Yep. So. And so this is, uh, you can show them while I'm talking. These are related to the neighborhood code. I looked at the map. And I was a little surprised to find our neighborhood on Colchester Ave, which is residential low, being changed to corridor, which is essentially the highest density with unlimited units, 80% lot coverage. Um, we already have commercial in the neighborhood. I'm not opposed to commercial. But uh, right below us, you have Salmon Hole in the Inner Vale. And right on the other side, you have Green Mountain Cemetery, Schmanska, and Centennial Woods. And behind Bayberry, you have Valley Ridge. And this is a very rich wildlife corridor. Um, I put up a game cam in my backyard a couple years ago because of proposed development on Riverside Ave, which would have drastically changed how animals could move through there. Um, even building four units just down the road from me in 2015 really, really changed the way wildlife moves through there. And so we're lucky as people in our neighborhood to have such amazing green space, to have that wildlife corridor. And I feel upzoning to this maximum density would severely impact the ability of wildlife to move through the area. Uh, and as you can see, there are coyotes, there are bobcats, mink, fisher, lots of deer, you know, raccoons, all sorts of stuff um, that makes use of that area. And this is directly in my backyard. And so um, I have other concerns, the steep slopes and other things, but I'll wait till we get to the neighborhood uh, code to see what's presented and then provide some more feedback. But um, very, very surprised. I don't know if anywhere else in the neighborhood was from lowest to highest density in the city. You know, that's uh, kind of my main point, and just to highlight all the things that uh, do use this area of the wildlife. What, what is the area again? Uh, so I live basically directly across from Green Mount Cemetery, and then my backyard goes down the hill um, to Riverside Ave, and that's basically where the entrance to Salmon Hole is there. Um, but they, they do make use of from all the way at like OZ Synagogue, all the way through there's a green space that connects all the way through there as well. Right there, and then with where the locust forest is, yep. and abuts the um, old Sisters of Mercy property. Back yep. in there. Yeah, that directly connects huge, to my backyard. Huge amount. Yeah, through green where space. All those ravines <laughs> go down, and it's so wild. Yeah. Yep. And those deer eat our produce every spring. Two or three of them. But anyhow, that's yeah, it. That's place a good thing. Yeah, they do. Um, I think right. my raccoon ate all our chickens. <laughs> <laughs> His name's Bruce. We know him. All right. Well, we are going to. If, is there any other items for speak out? I, I got a quick one. Yes. Lately, having trouble uh, getting to sleep and uh, sleeping until I want because the, the sound of motor vehicles is just outrageous lately. That's it. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to move ahead, and uh, just so you know, we have four pretty substantial items. There's the school commissioner's update, and uh, school taxes are a big deal this this year. Nah. We have uh, ballot items from our city councilors, and 
uh, neighborhood code and the UVM MOU, so um, please ask good questions. So we're going to start with, actually we're going to go back to introductions because Zariah, you are here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Zraya Hightower, she, her pronouns, Ward 1 City Councilor. Nick Vaden, he, him, uh, Hildred Drive. Did we miss anybody from introductions before? Jake. No. Or Jake. Yeah. Jake introduced himself. <laughs> oh. Oh, <laughs> um, my name's Lexi Krapp. I live on Colonial Square. Okay. Then we're moving ahead with uh, the school commissioner update by Gary Golden. Oh, good evening. Um, this is uh, buckle up. A lot of information I'll be throwing at you, but please, please, please um, contact me if you have questions. I will do another post tomorrow on a front porch forum with some of the video links that have happened since my last post, so you could dig in a little deeper with our commissioners and our uh, superintendent. Um, so, one quick one, Ward 1 has an open commissioner position and a young man by the name of Rita Khoury is the only person running. Uh, he is a 2018 Burlington High School graduate. He's um, in the same class as our daughter, uh, Jolyn knows him and his twin really well. Um, he is just finishing up a four-year degree at um, Central Connecticut uh, State University where he played Division I soccer and he graduated with a 4.0, so pretty commendable. Uh, there have been questions about the process. Uh, our board president, Claire Wool, uh, talked with the PTO, talked with, I think she said, four different parents about running two other uh, Ward 1 community members about running and they all said no. Uh, Corey stepped up and said, I want to help my community because it's been so good to me. He is a um, Sudanese, um, global majority, former student of ours. Um, so he'll keep that tradition of having some global majority graduates on the board. We have three at the moment and we'll be down to two uh, with him. So that's my comment section. So let me do, start my 15 minutes. Uh, I did this in 20 on a, on a town meeting Monday night, so I'll try to, to get through. Um, why don't you go ahead and go to the second slide? And these are the three things that are really the main components of the budget. Um, we have our fixed costs and obligations. That's the five, it's roughly a 5% increase annually for wages. Um, it, for example, this is also sort of a perfect storm for the district. We were forced out of our high school because of PCB contamination, forced to come forward with a bond, uh, $160 million uh, construction starting from scratch. Uh, at the point that the plans were drawn up, none of the buildings passed uh, the regulations that were in place at that point. Uh, those regulations were changed mid-process. We may have been able to salvage a couple of buildings, but it was too late. We'd already passed the bond. We were already committed. Um, and then the common level appraisal, which we have no control over. So those are the three main components of the, of the budget um, process that was begun back in October. So these are the... Uh, the three main components of those fixed costs and obligations. Um, wages and health care benefits, rent facilities, and other costs. Go ahead. And this is a breakdown of those. So I'm trying to be really sequential with you, but also you have access to these articles. Please read up and um, ask me any questions you have. So when we talk about the wages, said as I said, 5% negotiated costs. Pretty much all of our, we have three main unions that represent our staff. All of them have settled at around a 5% range, which, which puts us clearly in the middle of the county. Um, we don't have the resources of an Essex Junction 
or the CVU district that are the highest paying, but we definitely did not want to lose out staff to other schools that, you know, middle was good. You know, that's what we can do. Uh, but the benefit hit from the health care rate increase is what killed us on, on this section. 18% all, you know, last year was 12, I think. I, I tried to count up, probably within the last 10 years of rate increases, we're at 80% or during that time frame. So can we say one payer? Um, I mean, just it's crazy that this is an annual hit and all efforts we've renegotiated um, where we have a statewide health care package that's offered to every teacher in the state, uh, sort of a moderate range of benefits. That was supposed to fix this. That was when I was still working five years ago. It didn't. Um, so those are, you know, one we've negotiated, one is out of our control. Um, then we have fairly large rent and facility costs. We are paying rent downtown at Macy's, a million and a half a year to rent that space. Um, we rent space for the tech center at the airport, a uh, set of buildings on Wilston Road, um, the old health club that was behind the old borders just down the street from Macy's. Um, those all, any new cost to us over the last couple of years. We also are renovating a space out at Rock Point for our alternative programs on top and horizons. I've worked with them in my past. Um, they really need a standalone space, but with access to the high school, Rock Point was available. We're, you know, they're breaking ground and renovating that space as we speak. And then next year, IAA is having a um, HVAC renovations done and we need to house those students somewhere. We're closing the whole building. Some, uh, most of the students will be at St. Mark's. The uh, younger two grades will be at um, Sarah Holbrook. And so we've got to pay rent, pay renovations at all those places. Um, that money has come for the renovation and also for the, some of those other costs. Some of those are gonna be federal money left over from the uh, COVID funds but there's still a hit in there for us. Uh, and then all of our other costs, food services and transportation, all at least 5% inflation. So that's what we had control over. Uh, good. Um, the next step was Act 127. 5% cap went away maybe starting today. First vote at the House, uh, Troy was telling me beforehand. Uh, we will, so that will affect us. Um, I'll talk more in a moment, but we're, we're only gonna have to raise our budget a percent and a half. Uh, we, uh, our administration came with some cuts after some of us on the board asked them to, and it was fortuitous. Uh, where we really benefit is the weighted student formula. That's the other part of Act 127. We asked for this um, 20 years ago when I was in the district when the huge wave of our Somali Bantu students arrived, every school had to create a, a separate classroom with two full-time teachers, all of it uncompensated by the state. Commissioner came through, nodded approvingly, but did nothing to help us with that. Weighted student formula finally does. Um, the problem is this, the districts who benefited from not taking on those families and students um, now have a hit on their budgets. Um, and that was part of what the 5% cap was to address. So it's still a mess in the making. Um, the, we're trying to work our way through it. Um, but that's, this is a combination. So with our, um, the, we're all, the other part of the kind of perfect storm is the COVID money ran out both locally, it's called the ESSER funds, um, elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds that came out of COVID, uh, expire this September. Uh, state level also, a lot of same sort of funding expiring. So that's part of the perfect storm. Um, but with our offsets, um, we did not, in, um, there were 
almost matching numbers for things that we kept from the ESSER funds and things that we dropped either that had been made available or not. The administration came up at that point with a minus 2% tax rate. So we did our part. You know, and, the, and you know, the weighted student helped a lot. Um, it means that we get almost twice the amount per student from the state that a non-weighted student gets. And it's based on your population. That's that one you'll have to look at my, uh, I did links in the Front Porch Forum article that I did. Please dig if you want, call me, email. So the bond hits as well. We were, uh, just to be clear, we, you know, this was not of our doing, um, but, you know, we've made adjustments to the, the building as we've gone along, trying to keep it within budget, and we have. Um, we're looking at starting the school year 2026 to move in. Um, we were late. We were delayed getting started because of the different lawsuits. Um, and then they found PCBs in underneath the concrete foundation and they're going, no one ever does that. So that cost us a month this summer of pretty prime demolition time. So we're just punting and saying we'll use the summer that summer to move in but we've used 130 million of the bond so we've got to start paying the interest the bond servicing on that this year that's nine and a half million dollars uh, and that's our first hit so that's an increase of 8.7 percent to the tax rate so now we're at uh, a six percent tax rate which is really pretty amazing when you're talking about you know building a hundred and sixty million dollar building um, so this is where the good news sort of ends <laughs> um, so go ahead um, so a little uh, primer on CLA so as an outgrowth of, of local control the decision has been for probably a century and a half that local funding is the is how you you're going to fund schools and property tax is your local fund um, we if we were just property we'd still be suffering I think Carter left before I could ask him I believe he said something around 50 to 60 percent of Burlington property is non-taxable whether it's the walking trails at the country club or it's UVM, hospital, Champlain, etc. Um, so our choice or the state has chosen to do it through um, the appraisals set by towns. Well that's great. Um, ours is recent, 2021, but you know our, our property sales have gone through the roof. And that's necessitating an adjustment. Because their goal is really to balance out, you know, what the actual cost is of property across the state to make the taxation fair. And I'm going over. Shoot. Um, so go ahead for one more. Um, ours means that we're down to 87.46% rate, which is them saying you're being your current assessment is only covering. 87 and a half percent of the actual value of your home. The CLA adjusts at 100 uh, percent. Trust me, we're not the worst. Stowe has not done a reassessment in 12 years and they're at like 68 percent. So imagine the hit they're getting. Um, there was some talk, a couple, I found an article a couple years ago, they started a reappraisal, but I, there's no, there, it didn't end. They realized, oh crap, you know, pol <laughs> politically it is, you know, it's not something you want to go through casually, I guess. So we're in better shape for that, um, but it's still a huge hit, again, out of our control. Um, so as of today, this is our tax rate. The, uh, n you know, and, you know, it's regrettable that we're here. Um, I've watched a couple of 
our administration people and some of my colleagues from the board kind of making boogeymen of the process of the richer schools who have really taken advantage of that 5% cap idea. The reality is we all, you know, was it was it the second lowest quality of building in the country as far as our school stock. Every board out there is scrambling for money. And if they abuse the 5% cap to get there, it's a little understandable. So, you know, there are no bad guys, but there are realities. You know, um, the COVID money going away on both fronts is probably a, a large part of this. Um, and our properties being bought up from out of towners is another big part with the CLA. So, if Act 127 does, if the cap goes away, we're looking at a percent and a half increase on top of this. Um, it's another seventy-four dollars. Why don't you go ahead and do one more? Um, so this is sort of encapsulating all the new costs that have gotten us here. One more, and then I'll start taking some questions. So this is the impact as of today. Uh, if you're a three hundred seventy k house homestead, looking at seven forty nine. If you add the percent and a half, you're at about eight fifty. Um, if you're an income taxpayer, uh, you're going to go with 50k income. You're going from 134 to around 170 dollars. I'm not going to revise these until it's official, because who the hell knows what's going to happen next couple of days. Um, the reality is, you're going to get we we're going to get hit somewhere. I was teasing one somebody earlier that. You know, if it was Tim, that the, you know CLA could have hit the town, and then you're paying taxes there. It's just by being property-based taxation, it's the schools, and that's just the reality. And there's no bad men, bad people in this. It's just an expensive proposition to run a school in this time when you need to build a new building. Because um, seven of that is. Um, the school, the bond. Um, so hope you'll support us. Hope you'll vote. I'm asking for your vote. That's an old Tip O'Neill comment. <laughs> you know, you can't expect the vote if you don't ask for the vote. And I'm, we're asking now. Ask, ask away. I'm, I'm beyond. Maybe a couple of minutes of questions. Brief question. I apologize. Yes. Yeah. Has there been <clears throat> any locker? Has there been any um, discussion of alternative? Taxing, I know it wouldn't probably take effect by the time right. all of the school voting came around, but has there been any, any talk of like land value tax or alternative tax styles? It's, it's a state question, and it's one of those, again, pitting wealthier districts and towns with not wealthy. You know, the, um, we fought this fight in the 90s with the Brigham decision, which was a um, family in a poor town in southern Vermont sued the state because their kids weren't getting the education that Vernon across the state was getting having Vermont Yankee next door, you know, with almost a zero tax rate for their schools. So, you know, this is just an ongoing process of how do you pay for one of the most expensive things, the only expensive thing you vote directly on as a citizen in Vermont. Massachusetts has a 1% sales tax that's dedicated just to school construction. And that's what we're going to start advocating for here. Does that pit us yet again against the New Hampshire neighbors? Our businesses that have to compete with New Hampshire has no sales tax. Yeah, but you know, it's where else other than the feds? And the feds, as long as one house is Republican, you know, they are going. They're not going to support public education. It's the biggest unions in the country now that they've sort of dismantled the post office some. Um, and you, I grew up in the South, you know, with um, the segregation and the first thing that went up were every church started a private school. And that became like an, al that became the other alternative school district. When I was growing up, there's a black part and a white part of our school district and they didn't meet until high school. Um, it, we just split again, you know, white and rich white, black, poor, and black. So anyway, 
that's where we're headed. Um, a quick follow-up. Uh, yep. have, have you heard anything of like land value tax or alternative tax styles coming coming around? Or the only thing I've heard Ways and Means talking about uh, is the wealth tax. There's two forms of wealth tax that are currently still on the wall, um, taxing income folks who have incomes uh, or assets greater than 10 million, um, and then a capital gains. Um, they haven't at all talked about where that would be earmarked for. Yeah. Um, I do know Ways and Means is, I did, and to be fair, they've spent all their time over the past two weeks on H850, which is the act that, uh, the, the bill that's going to repeal the 5% the cap. Um, I, I can talk more about that for anybody who wants to hear it. Um, and Ways and Means, I, I, they are committed to finding any levers they can pull, but I, nothing permanent about uh, how we're going to fund education at this point. Um, the, the conversation in the House today was all about this is a clear indication of how broken things are and we've got to figure this out. Earhart? But, yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, Gary. Uh, this is Wisning. Um, so maybe could you talk a little bit more about income sensitivity? Last I knew, uh, approximately 70% of Burlington uh, homestead taxpayers were income sensitized. I saw that you had a little graphic there about uh, what somebody at uh, $50,000 household income level, what their increase would be. It might be nice to uh, tell folks a little bit more who may not know about income sensitivity. Uh, my recollection is that um, it's a sliding scale, but that you can receive some form of income sensitivity, potentially up to about $125,000, $128,000 um, worth of household income. I don't know if you've got you know, a chart or something that shows what people's increases might be if they're income sensitized at, at different levels. Um, I, regretfully, our, that's not info that's been given to us very in any form. But anyone who had, I've actually suggested to Carter and I'll say to Jeff as well, you know, having that, those kind of workshops available, I, I think the part, the political parties need to step up to help, well, I think, I, I, at least community organizations well, to help people. We will do that. Not, not to be argumentative, but I think in, in the past, the superintendent has uh, prepared uh, okay charts like that, and I think that would be helpful uh, for, for voters to make an informed decision. The other follow-up question is, has there been any estimate on the impact this is going to have on rents and renters? Um, because as, you know, renters aren't paying uh, property taxes for education directly, but they do pay it through their rent, and we have a split homestead uh, tax rate as well as a non-homestead tax rate, which includes all commercial properties, including uh, residential uh, commercial rental um, and so if they're going to see a large increase there is a, I would think think a potential for uh, in, more increased rents um, in in Burlington and statewide yeah I've tried to make that clear during the some of our finance meetings that you know no one's going to get a pass on this one the renters will suffer as well not suffer they'll be affected as well try to be accurate just a, a comment we do have a renter uh, tax credit I was actually doing yep. tax returns this morning and filling out tax, renter tax credit yeah, yeah. forms. I actually worked on it. And then so so what I'll do is I'll, I'll nudge the administration yeah. tomorrow to do that chart. I'll put that out in a separate post be really on Front Porch Forum. And um, I don't know how far they're going to be able to broadcast or project down for what rent How's rent is going to be affected, but we sort of can do a percentage. And I, I can give Stu a call to see what he's going to do. With, you know, he's our old North End person. So, uh, Richard, maybe one or two more. Go ahead. You tell me when you're, we're done. Who's, who I, did, has I just, I just want to. Not Richard, I'm sorry. I just want to ask if there had been any analysis of the impact of TIF financing on the Ed Fund, since TIF financing sucks money out of the Ed Fund statewide. Yeah, that one's out of my pay grade. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I will say, and it's sort of, the legislature's made some really important decisions over the last couple of years around free lunch, et cetera. You know, those have come out of the Ed Fund. And so we can't be surprised, you know, and at that point, I wasn't aboard yet, I'm going, 
oh, this the, the trickle down effect for this, you know, basically all the social needs for our students are all met through the school budget. It's you know free lunches, health care, mental health. You know, there there's no state mechanism to reimburse us for any of that, right. and COVID just exacerbated all that. I, I did uh, work with students with behavior issues when I was a special educator. And I can't imagine doing that field now because it's just, everyone is just hurting across the board. So no, I, we haven't gotten there yet. Thank you. We're gonna move on. Can I ask a we're question? Shy of time. Well, let me, let me say I, real quick, Jeff. I, um, I'm going to set up a he Zoom. He has a question. No, I'd like to ask a question if I could. No, I, it's, I, I, it's got to be a short question. It's a, it'll be short, I think. Okay, but go for he, it. I think, Gary, I appreciate the presentation. I'm not sure you touched on the most important thing about asking for our vote, yes. which is what happens if we vote no. So we have kids in the school. The yep. kids have really suffered the last several years. Yep. A lot of kids in our neighborhood that go to IAA are going to be displaced for more than a year. Yep. Can you tell us about what the school board can do, will have to do, if we vote no? Well, the... The reality is that it would take, I'm going to change a little bit of how it's been presented to us. Um, it would, to get us below now 11% tax rate would be <clears throat> riffing 50 teachers, I will say 70 combination of, 50, of teachers and, and administration, I, I think. I'm going to call them on it. You know, it, that's sort of a scare tactic. And I would really want to be honest. If we make those kind of cuts, they are across the board. So you really are talking 40 students, 40 teachers, and 20 to 30 staff. Um, and only to get a couple, you know, it's not only. I'm, we're very fortunate that, you know, this tax hit is not hard on us as retirees. So, you know, we really try to be cognizant of it. That's, that's the only thing we have control over. And, you know, we've got to spend this IAA money or it's going to go away. You know, this it's expiring. Uh, so, you know, that's there. We, you know, the school is not our idea to, we're, you know, honestly, we're looking at a 60 to $70 million rehab of the high school to make it ADA compliant and, and energy efficient. So we were going to get a hit. You know, we just weren't looking at $182 million, $200 million, sorry. So yeah, we know. We know this is awful. My hunch is, my suggestion will be, we resubmit for this, a vote on the same amount. Uh, we don't even know if we're voting on town meeting day. We may be voting in April. I don't, I have not, Troy has mechanisms that you've seen in Vermont Digger in the articles you know, we're close enough that maybe we, no, I don't think we can do it. It's the ballot, you know, it's the mail out ballot that's the problem. So we're probably looking at a standalone vote already. And then we would just roll it over and vote on that amount again, just telling people, you know, we don't have, there's nowhere we can cut other than uh, staff. Thank you, though, this is a good question. Well, we've got to move forward. Um, Thank you. Anyway, thank you very much. Sure. And I think uh, we're us steering committee are going to have to work hard to make sure we have a good summary of what's been discussed here in our minutes, which we're going to publish on front porch forum. <laughs> you looking at me? <laughs> I'm just looking at our steering committee. So I don't know how. Tim feels, but I know we've got seven minutes until neighborhood code. There's two things on the ballot other than the school budget. We can just tell you what those two things are, and then I don't know if we want to switch to, I just don't want to give the substantive discussions less time. If, I feel the same way. Okay, good. So there's two other things. The school budget, obviously, we just had a long presentation on. There's two other things on the budget. One of them is the public safety tax. And the other one is BED's financial, inner financial handlings. Um, so the public safety tax is, a, is it's, it, it's not that it's a miss, oh, I'll let, but it's like, I'll just say my piece and then Tim might have a longer piece. It's um, partially it's just like, it is a public safety tax, all of the money that would go 
be raised through the public safety tax would obviously go to public safety, but this is to some extent a way to just raise our taxes <laughs> for our general budget. So we're seeing a shortfall in the general budget. We're not 100% sure yet what the public safety tax would be spent on, but it is a way to increase our overall budget is what I will, is my summary of it. And then BEDs is pretty, it's just, I don't actually 100% remember what we voted on, but it's something about them being able to use loans or borrow money in different ways, and they're a, they're a separate entity from the rest of the city, so they any money that they make or lose is kind of contained as an enterprise fund within BED, so it doesn't affect the rest of the city's finances, largely. Tim? I'm so, I'm so relieved you said that about BED, because <laughs> I'm like panicking, I'm like, I... There's been, a, we've had a lot going on. So many votes. <laughs> um, our meeting uh, on Monday clocked in at a brisk seven hours. Um, the, the document that I was just uh, just sharing with Zariah is the, uh, the memo that we got after our work session on January 22nd uh, on the budget that, t that gives some of the details about this 4% um, public safety tax increase. Um, you know, I think we can answer some questions about that, but that it's important for everybody to understand that that is going to be in addition to the school tax increase. So it is it is a cumulative <coughs> tax increase, um, and that is, as Zariah said, to make up for essentially shortcomings in the general fund. But this money will be devoted to public safety issues. Um, the administration has done other things to sort of close the budgetary gap. Um, there's increase uh, in the uh, tax on hotel rooms, um, which is going to raise about a million dollars um, in revenue. They are planning three million dollars, four million dollars, three million, three million dollars in um, um, in cuts. Um, there is some leftover uh, ARPA money um, that was set aside for things that haven't been used. That's another hundred something thousand dollars so um, you know bits and pieces are coming together uh, you know and so that's where we are on the budget um, I am you know con I think we're all we're all concerned um, I'm concerned that any tax increase in addition to what the, the, the schools are asking for is going to complicate the vote on the schools having said that I think this is necessary so it's a challenging budgetary season. Questions? Thank you. Is it is it is it reasonable to say that the public safety tax increase is being called that to increase the likelihood that it might pass, whereas it's really just about a tax increase? Uh, I mean, all of the money raised from the public safety tax will go towards public safety, so it'll go towards the fire and police department. But yes, I think that as it is making up for general budget shortfall, I think that's partially to guarantee, to, to help motivate. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's detailed information out there, and we can share it or direct you to where it is about what they expect the money to be spent on with respect to our police department and our fire department. And there is actually, I will say there's two reasons. So I think that's one reason. The second reason is, I don't remember if you remember a couple years ago, a couple years ago last year, years are blurring together. The city did do a general ask that all of the departments do a 2% cut. I know the police department was exempt from that, and I think the fire part department may have been as well. And so to some extent, it's like, yes, it is a general budget you know, shortfall and the public safety is the one area of growth, whereas we've tried to shrink the rest of the services in the city. So it's not, it's not just by name, it's also that is where our cost increases have been, where we spent the most money um, to increase that, to increase the general budget. So two reasons. Sharon? Sure. Um, so um, let me, let me just, think about what you just said. So um, my understanding is that the question is, is the four cents on public safety, but it's a, it, it authorizes the council to call that up, but doesn't, it's not a, us 
fait accompli. Correct. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, because this is a dedicated tax, if indeed, if indeed you ended up calling that up, you would then be able to reduce the amount of general fund dollars that you give to police and fire so that you would be able to spread that around. Is that correct? Am I correct in that? That is correct. That is not the plan. So the plan is to continue to do cuts across the rest of the city in order to fund increases, largely in public safety. Not exclusively, but largely. Okay. All right. Well, anyways, but um, but the point is that you wouldn't that the city would not necessarily call up four cents. I still don't like it, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I understand that it could be less than that. It, it's it could be less than that, and it will be up to the next administration right. how okay. much. Thank that you. Would or wouldn't be. Richard. Yeah, Mila has a. Thanks. This is going to be a bit <laughs> contorted. Uh, Zariah, um, so along the lines, the mayor's message in the, in the North, uh, North Avenue News said, um, without these tax revenues, I do not believe it will be possible to balance the budget without cuts to the police department budget, um, which you've echoing what you said. But that's a sort of form of blackmail, isn't it? And I don't understand why it's being framed in that way. Well, I, obviously, I, people understand that public safety is is a very, very hot button, and that. But this is basically saying we screwed up getting revenue for the last 12 years. Now you're going to have to pay for it. In in in. Uh, uh, otherwise, you're going to lose policemen. Far be it for me to defend the mayor, but or um, me. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I'm about to. Um, but I will say that I do think that because we have made cuts to other city departments, I think the next logical place would be public safety, and so um, I think I think cuts in other places would be more painful because we've already asked them to cut, and so. Say it again. To build up yes, space. correct. So we have. Down, yes. So that is the. I, I. I mean, again, that would be completely up to the administration. This administration doesn't have a lot of <laughs> say over like necessary, like what exactly that would end up doing. I guess they'd need the support of the council, but. <laughs> Kathy. <clears throat> Hi. I thought that we were way down on policemen in the force right now. So we haven't been paying them. Why is there all of a sudden a need to put more money into that budget when for the past two years they have been saving on personnel? So I'm going to grab the mic for this one. Um, so right now there are increases. So we have a lot of new positions. We have the CSOs, the CSLs. We have... Um, Sorry, yes, community support officers, service officers, I forget what the new service. formal service officers, and community service liaisons. So those are folks who provide, in some cases, more proactive services, or in other cases, some of the same services. Um, and then we're also trying to stand up a new model of, of which we're calling CARES, which is some, it's a more, an alternative response system that doesn't just involve police officers. So that is what is the expense cost going forward. What happened to the last few years and why we had no reduction in costs before we put in the, <laughs> the increased salaries for officers, before we had the CSOs and the CSLs, I don't know why there were no reductions in other years to the budgets. But um, I do think that now with a more robust system and assuming that our officer count continues to increase, we, are, we have added services to our public safety response. But those people that you've added, the CSOs and CSLs, are for sure not making the same income as a police officer. They are not. Is. Not even close. And so, you know, in some ways you're still really not spending that money. Right. And the original, the goal of the whole an original reduction was to pay for those things with that. And I, I have not received a clear answer on why that hasn't happened or wasn't budgeted that way in the last four years. <laughs> We've got a question online. Uh, Milo? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I've just been taking some notes. Uh, let me start with uh, some of the questions that were just um, asked. So the CARES unit will be Burlington's CAHOOTS Hoops model. Uh, CAHOOTS is a very community-driven um, response. Uh, a lot of people in our community, including um, stakeholders who work with the Howard Center, uh, work with the street team, who work uh, with dealing with people who have mental health issues. This was a very successful program out in Eugene, Oregon, and a lot of people really wanted to see it brought here, and we're getting closer and uh, closer to that. The budget um, with regards to the police department, in order to deal with the continued issues around uh, the labor shortage for policing because people continue to leave policing. There are labor shortages not only in Burlington, but the state of Vermont, including the Vermont State Police, uh, all across this country. So we have sign-on bonuses, we have retention bonuses, and that has been the source of some of the money as well. Uh, the police department is going to need uh, current updated models of tasers. The tasers that they have right now are actually no longer being made, um, and they're kind of going through them, including going through the batteries. So they need to have um, updates in that equipment. As we all know, tasers are better than using guns, and the newer models are safer for the people that use them and for the people that are used on. There's also an issue with, um, haven't gotten a response as to exactly how much we're in arrears, but there's an issue with uh, the company that provides the software for body cam footage. Uh, so we're in arrears to them right now. Part of the reason is that we've had to dramatically increase the amount of storage cost um, and how long the videos are retained, and that is because of the different types of crimes that we have been seeing um, that have led to uh, justified use of force. So that's increased our cause. We're trying to get more information on that. Um, with regards to uh, BED and uh, that ballot item, essentially, State gets this ballot, ballot item would allow them to increase their credit like, uh, rating with uh, having the additional line of credit. Not that they're planning right now on using it, but just gets us in a gets them in a, a better uh, credit since the credit stands. Um, and I will just finally say that. Uh, what is happening right now is extremely demoralizing. Uh, we are in really serious financial state. Um, the deficit is millions and millions of dollars. So there's a lot of things in process right now uh, that uh, Zoraya already reviewed. Um, and hopefully some of this will pull money um, from other areas. But uh, whatever happens, it's, it's going to hurt. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move forward. Um, I apologize that we don't have more time for questions. Um, we're going to move into the neighborhood code discussion. Oh. Megan, you're on. Do you have a presentation? Um, yeah. Sure, you can go right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the hot seat. Yeah. All right, we're already up on the screen. So um, I came in right after the introductions, but I think I know many of you. I'm Megan Tuttle. I'm the planning director at the city, and this is Sarah Morgan. She's a planner in our office. Um, given that our time um, tonight is limited and you have another big item, 
Um, we're going to move through just a couple pieces of a presentation. We'll share this with the steering committee to, to post for all of you later. Some of you have seen other presentations we've given about the neighborhood code, and many of the members of your steering committee and, and neighbors have shared questions with us since we were here last. So tonight we're going to focus mostly on answering a couple of the questions that we have already received in advance of tonight, and hopefully we'll have some time for a few more tonight as well. So um, I'm going to skip ahead here. I think many of you know what we're, what we're looking at in terms of the neighborhood code enabling more um, neighborhood scale housing types citywide. One of the questions that we've heard a number of times is actually about, um, you know, why are we doing this instead of trying to promote development on undeveloped lots or bigger lots in other parts of the city? And so I, we wanted to share this just as a very simplified way of showing that there are other parts of the city, particularly these areas in gold, um, that are downtown, they are the south end, the new area where the council approved a new zoning framework called the South End Innovation District. Um, you know, these are areas where we have large sites that might be good candidates for, you know, new buildings, increased density, um, mixed use development that includes homes and places where we can see businesses. Um, but that's actually a fairly constrained part of the city. It's a pretty small area of the city. And while that is a small area of the city, we have been doing a lot of work. I know I, I have been here at a lot of these meetings over the last several years talking with many of you about lots of different types of changes that we've been trying to make to our zoning rules that will actually help facilitate implementation of new development on those sites too, and, and primarily. Um, so this is definitely, the neighborhood code is following almost a decade of work that we've been trying to do to help make those sites more possible to build on as one of the solutions to help us create more housing in the city. Um, so I just, I want to share that just as important context for what we're talking about. And then somebody mentioned earlier during the, the school uh, budget presentation about the, the amount of the city's land area or lots in the city that are tax exempt. You know, we, we certainly talked about institutions, but I think what this map also shows is that all of the areas in green are also not only exempt, but off limits for development because of our values as a community around conservation of open spaces, of important natural systems. These are places like the Intervale and parks um, that we, want to protect and preserve for all of our quality of life and for the natural environment's quality. Um, so that brings us to this sort of blue area, which are the residential <laughs> neighborhoods in the city and the areas that of the city that are in our residential zoning districts, um, and really illustrates why the neighborhood code is an important complement in terms of the not only the places in the city where we could see new homes, but the scale and type of city of homes that we could see. We've shown, I think, versions of this before in terms of the types of housing that we're really talking about, trying to help support and the fact that in many of the residential areas of the city, most of them are not allowed. And the neighborhood code is really aiming to get us to a place where more of these can be allowed. Um, we're doing this through a combination of making some changes to the zoning rules for the zoning districts and making some changes to the zoning map. So I want to actually skip ahead to talking about the map because that's something we've heard a lot of questions about. Um, when you have a chance to look at these, I think on a different screen, you'll, you'll be able to see the colors a little bit better. Um, but the map on the left is the map of our current zoning districts, and the map on the right is the map of the proposed zoning districts under the neighborhood code. And one thing that we've heard a lot of questions about, particularly from this, this um, neighborhood, is just about, you know, why is this area proposed to be changed from RL to RM, but nowhere else in the city is? Um, so I want to just share really quickly that this area, particularly between Mansfield and uh, Willard Street, is one of five small areas in the city that are currently zoned RL that the neighborhood code recommends rezoning to RM. 
um, the, an area kind of south of downtown, centering on South Union Street, the Five Sisters neighborhood, the Lakeside neighborhood, and also the, the streets that are off of Shelburne Road, like Hoover, Clymer, that area, are also proposed to be changed from RL to RM. Um, this recommendation was something that a joint committee, including Councillor Hightower and the Planning Commission, other councillors, spent quite a bit of time talking about in terms of, you know, when we dig into the details, I think some folks heard me say at the council meeting that some of this stuff is a little bit wonky. Um, but really, I think when we dig into the details of what it means for us to actually um, see new homes created in different neighborhoods across the city, we know that there are very, um, big differences in terms of the lot sizes, the shapes of buildings on lots, where the buildings are placed on a lot, um, in terms of you know, how close they are to a street or how you know, far away they might be. Um, and so we looked at a couple of really kind of central issues when thinking about whether or not the neighborhood code would be able to be implemented in every neighborhood. Um, and realized that things like the existing lot coverage in neighborhoods and the size of lots in neighborhoods were going to be really important considerations for whether or not new homes could be created within whether they're in an RL zoning district or in an RM zoning district. So using information about the size of lots and the amount of lot coverage, the committee was able to look citywide at all of the residential zoning districts and use these two kind of um, key criteria to determine whether or not our zoning standards could really, these neighborhood code standards could actually um, be applicable or be implemented. And that is really what then informed the decision about um, those, those five areas that were recommended to be changed from RL to RM. So I think I'm going to go back here to just kind of show a little bit more um, about what we mean. And this also relates to questions that we've been getting about, you know, what, what would the impact of these changes be in terms of stormwater? Um, so this is, a, again, this area between Willard and Mansfield. Um, and this is looking just at the existing amount of lot coverage that um, properties in this area have today. And for those of you who may not know what I mean by lot coverage, I mean basically the size of your, of your property and the amount of it that's covered by a building or a, a parking area, your driveway, things where stormwater can't penetrate the ground ultimately. Um, and we know under our existing zoning standards all the way on the left that many of the properties in this neighborhood are already built more intensely than the lot coverage limits that exist in our zoning today. And as we looked at you know, the changes that we're proposing to the RL district, we saw that more than half of the properties would still be over the existing, the, the lot coverage limits that were proposed as part of RL. And why this is important is for us, it's, it helps us understand how the, how the neighborhood code could be applied. Um, particularly when we think about creating new homes on lots, this could be a limitation. But even for folks that might want to create um, an addition on their home, they might need to expand a portion of their home for a family member or um, to make their home more accessible, to make modifications to their home. This can be a major factor that could limit the expansion of how housing homes in these neighborhoods could be used today. So we felt like this was a really important thing for us to look more closely at in terms of thinking about whether um, this neighborhood would be part of the new RL, um, which is this map in the middle, or part of the new RM zone, which is the map on the right, sorry, and um, really found that a lot of those constraints could be um, addressed in the RM district. We've also heard, um, well, I'll also say too, sorry, back on this one, um, this relates again, as I said before, to the stormwater question. And I think folks have been asking about how these changes could, um, how they would impact stormwater management in this area in particular. And I think, again, this just helps us understand that 
Um, as the neighborhood code may be implemented, because of the amount of impervious coverage in this neighborhood today, um, we would likely see small expansions on some lots where there's room for that to happen. But if we were to see new homes and additions, it would actually probably be through the replacement of existing impervious areas, like a, a building in a backyard being renovated um, or a building being built on top of an existing parking area, for example. Um, so this area, I don't don't think would have as much of a, a major change in terms of the overall lot coverage in the neighborhood um, if buildings were to be built as a result. So another issue that we've heard a lot of questions about then is about, um, you know, what is, what is happening in the rest of the city? Um, if this area of the city is being recommended to be RM, um, why not RM in the rest of the city? And this is something that we have shared in presentations before that just kind of help us understand a, a range of options for how new homes could be added in different neighborhoods across the city. And what you might notice from these two graphics, one representing RL on the kind of top left and the other representing RM or residential medium on the bottom right, is that both of these districts will allow new options for how homes could be added in existing neighborhoods. So I think that's a really important point that some of the stuff that I just described about lot sizes and lot coverage and where um, new buildings could maybe be added has to do with some of the really specific dynamics of each individual neighborhood, but the neighborhood code kind of at the higher level is about how every neighborhood is also um, having opportunities to add new homes as well. And this just kind of illustrates how both the neighborhoods that would be in RM and neighborhoods that would be remaining in RL will have very similar opportunities for how those new homes could be added. We have been looking a lot at what these new standards could mean in different parts of the city, and we've been hearing more questions about, you know, more specifically, what could this mean? Um, and so we have looked at a couple more examples of how uh, the neighborhood code could maybe be implemented, particularly in this area, again, between uh, Willard and Mansfield, knowing, you know, kind of what's a common lot size. If someone were to try to add more units to a property and add some parking and meet all of the standards that the neighborhood code would still require. Um, this is a, a kind of graphic example of that. Um, but we also have a couple examples of, of real buildings that are in this neighborhood that are similar, I think, to what we might expect. And so there's two things that we, we can say about these real world examples. Um, one is that when we're talking about the neighborhood code and we're talking about, um, you know, density, we've, we've tried to intentionally reframe the way that our zoning would um, look at homes away from a sort of density standard and more to a more specific kind of building size and things like lot coverage that would provide some flexibility for how many homes could be in that building, but would help give us a, a more um, consistent sense of how big those buildings might be able to be. And so I think these um, can help illustrate kind of what we mean by that. Um, I think these are also really helpful examples to just show, you know, what does um, a four unit building on a lot with 60% lot coverage look like. Um, again, these are real examples from this neighborhood. And when we start to think about how could this lots like these maybe evolve, I think again, um, we've heard some questions about, you know, why more than one building? How would that actually get implemented? I think these are really good examples that just show that when we look at all of the standards together, um, we're not likely to see many lots that actually have multiple buildings because of the dynamics of fitting it all onto a lot, 
providing some parking, leaving open space for uh, stormwater management, and that it would likely look like you know, in the um, on the property on the right, make, maybe that garage in the backyard gets converted into a unit, um, but it's not significantly expanding the amount of built area that's already on a property. So, these are just a couple examples that we wanted to provide um, in in response to some of the questions that we've heard. Um, there's a lot more information. I know many of you have been looking at our website. Um, I'll also say that we are hosting a longer format. Um, question and answer session next Tuesday, the 20th, at, at the library at, at Fletcher Room at uh, Fletcher Free Library. Um, and we will have both an opportunity to attend in person and online. And if you go to our website to find information about that, there's also a link where you can submit questions. And so we're doing our best to try to pull together um, more information that we'll be posting in conjunction with that meeting that answers a lot of the other questions that we're getting. But these are some of the things that we heard from your steering committee for tonight. So, Sorry, and I'm going to jump in with one more comment just on process, because I do just want to say that like, we set this for public hearing. Tim actually voted no on that because he wasn't supportive of like how fast this has gone. And I did vote yes on this, and I am supportive of this proposal. But I also think there's a lot that we didn't get right, right? Like the wildlife, we only looked at it from a planning perspective, not from a scientific perspective on some of the things like wildlife. So I think that we shouldn't take this as this is the final proposal. We should set, set, take this as this has been set for public hearing for the exact purpose of getting folks feedback and making changes and I'm I do think we didn't get it 100% right so I'm very open to hearing what changes folks want and whether that is in this administration or in the next administration which then I won't be responsible for but um, of getting those changes across across the finish line so I just wanted to add that as as what we're where we're at <laughs> thank we've, you I should have said that yeah we've got some um, Three questions and then we're going to move on. Okay. So uh, what strikes me is that uh, if you look at the actual document and some of the charts kind of bring that through, there, there's a sort of extremism in the neighborhood code that doesn't necessarily come through clearly in the presentation, which seems much more reasonable and moderate in terms of this isn't likely to happen and this might not be likely to happen. But what the neighborhood code provides for uh, in the case of, a, of an area like this, which is proposed to be upzoned kind of twice in changing from RL to RM would be a lot coverage increase of 70% from what we have at 35% now to go to go to go to 60 and really 60 is actually 70 because there's an additional 10% that you can have for driveways and decks and so forth so it's an extreme increase in lot coverage and the other thing is the number of units that can be put on a lot. So any lot in an RM zone, there are no limits as far as I can see on how large the lot has to be. Uh, any lot can have a six unit building and a four unit building for a total of 10 units on a single lot. Again, that's to me, strikes me as a, an extreme thing to allow in the code, even if, it, if, even if you don't think it's going to happen too often, uh, it might be necessary to kind of bulldoze whole blocks to really make that uh, you know, possible and feasible. But that's what the code is saying would be permitted, not even conditional uses. These are, these are permitted uses. So could you respond to that sense of extremism versus what appears to be kind of moderate and reasonable, but there's an underlying extremism I see there. Just making sure that Councillor Hightower, um, we're kind of sharing the microphone here. So um, yeah, I, I appreciate the question about allowing multiple buildings on a lot. And this is something that we have heard some questions about too. Ultimately, the reason that the code recommends this is that we do know that in some parts of the city, lots could be large enough that you just might physically be able to have room to fit multiple buildings <laughs> and maintain open space and have parking, that there could be some lots in the city that could do that. Um, but they would need to be much larger than the, the typical lot in this neighborhood in particular. 
The reason that we allow that flexibility, though, is to make sure that we're not foreclosing opportunities for how homes could be added in different areas in the city. Um, one of the things that we heard somebody say, for example, in one of our engagement sessions was, you know, I would love to put more homes in my backyard. I want to keep my single family home that's at the front of my lot already, but it would be great to be able to have a building in the back of my home that has a couple of units in it. Um, as a way to contribute more homes to the city and kind of do it in a way that respects the patterns of a neighborhood rather than just having, you know, one home on a lot that might be incentivized to be converted, for example. Um, so the, the goal was really to allow for some flexibility in terms of how new homes could be realized across the city. And yes, in some cases, there could be lots that are big enough to have more than one building. So. But, but our lot, excuse me. Our lot is 50 by 115, and we have figured it out. We could put 10 units, and 50 by 115 is pretty small. I mean, just I just couple. think, and you just said a couple. You heard, heard somebody who would like to put a couple, and honestly, I've seen this presentation. Please, next time, let everybody ask questions, because we've seen it, we've read it, and we have, like, three people get to ask questions. But that's what we need to know. Why would the city ever imagine that in this neighborhood with these small, I have a small Victorian house, it's what, 25 feet wide, or I don't know what it is. Why would you ever think it'd be a good idea for me to put four or six units in that home and four in my backyard and have 30% grass? I'll have no trees, I'll have no garden, I'll have nothing for stormwater. I mean, it's an outrageously, it's not a minor, a couple units. You are allowing 10 units in RM. And you need to say that. Right, I think we are saying that the code would allow multiple buildings with multiple units in it, but we've been asked many times and we've been working closely with folks who um, have, a, you know, we, we've been working really carefully to try to understand how this might be implemented. And I do respect and understand the dynamics of living in a neighborhood near campus um, can have different influences on how the neighborhood code could be implemented. But in general, um, what we have recognized is that um, this will be it will be much more incremental. I think in a lot of cases, being able to actually fit eight to 10 units on a lot would be incredibly challenging for many lots in the city. So, so respectfully, um, I just would like um, you to look at the fact that the state says that we have to have up to you, a parcel has to be able to accommodate four units right. per whatever. So my, my point is that in RL, Two structures, yes, we already have that for ADU, but why not limit it to four units? Okay, that's still a lot. And an RM, not my world, but RM, I would say maybe six units. I'm asking for reasonableness because it grew disproportionately as you talked. The more you talked, the more units got added. And I'm not, it's not the staff, it was the group collectively um, being inspired and wanting to create more housing. It wasn't, it wasn't malicious, it just happened. Um, <laughs> my point is, my point is um, also that um, the pressures here from investors is very different and that needs to be factored in by planning. It's not one size fits all. And so the, the thought that you will incentivize more people to come in, investors and developers, to buy single family homes and then put the maximum number of units in it. That is reality and that is harmful. And I want the planning department and the city council to really think long and hard because zoning should not end up being harmful. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to go hopefully kind of quick. Um, I feel pretty passionately as I know a lot of people do, but first I'd like to say thank you to both of you for all that you guys have done and as well as the city councilors for 
t uh, taking on such a uh, difficult project, especially in an area that is currently facing, as well as a lot of places in the U.S. and around the world, a really difficult housing crisis. Um, I just wanted to add a couple things um, just to give a different perspective to a couple, to the people in the room. Um, uh, burdening the shoulder of this as a community, I think, is mo more important than allowing sprawl to happen further. More horizontal sprawl equals more road infrastructure and other infrastructure that needs to be built outside of Burlington. So that means that tax dollars then leave Burlington. And I think that if we continue to create more sprawl outward, um, then that's gonna, it's just gonna keep driving people out, trying to find more lower, lower priced housing, lower priced rentals. We already see it happening. And just, just a couple of different points. 70% um, of microplastics in the water are from cars, and specifically car tires. So again, having more sprawl is just, is, more harmful and creating that infrastructure is more harmful in the case of any um, like lot coverage difference. Like the the adding of infrastructure to if we don't have this type of housing will be more harmful than the runoff uh, troubles that would happen with lot increase. Um, and also, we currently are building our roads at 11 to 11 and a half feet which again is so astronomically large, the minimum size uh, that uh, Vermont actually has put in is nine feet and that's a pretty good agreeable size that it should be. So if, if there's potential for us to have this new development, maybe we can reclaim some of this wasted infrastructure space and put that into green use that could be um, that could be some sorts of uh, chicane uh, rain gardens, and that can help with the storm water, water runoff. Um, I also just want to add that this is an iterative process. These neighborhood codes are iterative processes. This doesn't mean it's one-stop shop, we're going to do this. We've had four different codes in Burlington starting from the 40s, and um, this, this is a really strong way, and adding housing is potentially one of the only ways that people like myself and Joel and other people of uh, younger age demographics are going to be able to purchase a home. I, I don't see that happening for a lot of people unless we have more housing to, um, to es essentially disperse the burden among the community. And I think it's, again, it's this idea of the having this as a community um, a community shoulder instead of uh, worrying about like the individual. Thank you. This is going to be our last question. We're going to move on after this. But you didn't put it in the new north end where they have the big yards. Okay, Karen. Yeah, I, I, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the, uh, I have, oh, have noticed. Hold on. Can we, uh, we have Karen, someone asking a question here, please? We're not taxing tires either. Go ahead. Um, the new north end, uh, I was very surprised to see the map uh, that was up there because it was, it was all blue. There were no yellow spots in the new north end, and yet the new north end, I, there are many streets. I, I, I was on one recently that had relatively small houses, often rather modest and the sort of thing that wouldn't be a great loss if it were replaced by it, uh, but huge back backyards. In fact, one street with very large backyards and another street backing it with the very big backyards. There's room for an awful lot of housing there which wouldn't really, there's lots of space. And there, the fact that, of course, it's not close to downtown, but I mean, if you put a lot of housing in, there'll be businesses will be coming up quick and you can always add bus lines to make things easier to get around. So why is the new North End being just left out of this? Why don't we start looking? That's a far easier place to start filling in. There's so much more space there. Yeah, so the new North End is being included in this. Um, and I think this has been something that's been kind of hard to communicate. Um, 
because we have been talking and answering a lot of questions about why there are changes to the map itself, but um, in all of the areas of the city that are currently zoned for low density and would continue to be zoned for low density, there are changes to what would be allowed in those neighborhoods too. So um, allowing multiple units on a lot, allowing for buildings in backyards, all of the same things that we've been talking about in terms of what could happen over here um, would also be possible up there. Um, there are some differences in terms of what the code currently recommends could happen out in, in places like the New North End um, in terms of lot coverage. One, you've kind of hit on the exact reason. Um, lots are generally bigger. They're generally less built on already. Um, so we don't need to kind of change the rules as much by allowing multiple buildings and allowing multiple units in those buildings, there's a lot more flexibility that's created in those neighborhoods than what would ever be allowed today. And so I think that's just something that's really important as we've been getting questions about, um, you know, what, what are other parts of the city doing that there would definitely be a lot of opportunity for that as well. I'm gonna chime in here too, because we did talk about um, getting rid of RL and just doing the whole city as RM. Um, I think was the proposal we were split on that so it didn't it didn't it wasn't a proposal that was moved forward I think what I'm hearing based on the feedback is I don't know if that's gonna pass but I think at least getting RL like the gap between RL and RM a little closer to each other so allowing maybe a little bit more density on RL a little bit less density on RM might be a compromise to move forward so that it is more spread out across the city I obviously don't know if that'll pass but um, I think that that is a I think that that might be something that I can Tim and I can work on I don't know where Tim's at no I'm just looking <laughs> I would let that I can work on putting forward <laughs> okay um, I think we are out of time. I apologize. Uh, I have one really quick thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we <laughs> got cut off. Um, we tried. I appreciate everyone's questions, and um, I apologize we don't have more time. But uh, can can I put in one last plug again? Just. I know, Tom. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the people want to ask questions. On next, again, next Tuesday night, we're going to have a Q, another Q&A session. And as Councillor Hightower noted, um, on February 26th, the council will be having a public hearing as well, which is also an opportunity for them to hear input on this. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. All right. Um, next up is uh, the UVM Medical Center. And you're, you've got slides. Yes, and, and the, the planning team is letting me use their computer. Okay. Time. All right. Have a. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, there's a couple seats um, back there. Right yes. okay. I'm going to get out All right. Dave, do you want me to drive and yeah, you sit ahead. here? Okay. Sure, I'm just going to. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm just going to push this in. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Karen Vastine. I work in the Office of Government and Community Relations for the UVM Health Network, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Dave Kilty, who is the vice president of something really important, planning and development. Uh, <laughs> facilities planning and facilities development. Facilities planning and development for the UVM Health Network. And first of all, happy Valentine's Day, and also thank you for having us here. We'll be quick, and just as, um, Megan was quick to share with you all at the beginning of her presentation other opportunities for question and answer. Just wanted to assure you, because we're going to go through this quickly, that there will be many other opportunities for us to engage with you. And um, we'll be having a Q&A session, actually, on March 7th. So I'll be sure to note that for you all again. So in case anybody's wondering if you'll get to ask your questions, that will be another opportunity. So we're here to talk about our land use MOU. Um, 
So this has been in existence since 1999. Thank you to Sharon Busher and many of you in this room who actually worked on this at the time. Um, and what this sets out is um, a, a set of parameters for um, how we do our development on the campus, but it also sets what I would call rules of engagement for how we interact with and support uh, the residents who are closest to the UVM Medical Center campus. So the current MOU includes um, several parameters around building density, height restrictions, and then also um, agreements that we have with the uh, neighborhood uh, residents right around us. For instance, access to the community garden that we will not um, uh, you know, uh, develop the sliding hill and that we offer parking um, at the state lab building, the former state lab building, uh, for many um, different types of opportunities. So I think we're in an interesting point. We're actually at an interest, we're almost identically um, in the same place as we were in 1999 in terms of UVM Medical Center's bed capacity is not keeping up with um, both what our community needs as well as our region. Um, and so in order for us to keep up with that, we have a projected expansion of 242 inpatient beds. Um, we cannot expand inpatient beds without also expanding the services that support patients. Um, Dr. Leffler, our president and CEO, COO, likes to say that we have the largest um, restaurant in all of Vermont um, serving the most people and um, still it doesn't uh, would not adequately serve 242 additional um, inpatient beds and we can't do this without having accountability um, with you all so just so that you all have the big picture here because that's what we can do in the short amount of time we have we are working with the city um, planning office right now on the MOU itself and we hope to have a red line version of that to share with you in the coming weeks um, you will see that there will be no change regarding parking no change regarding access for the community gardeners gardeners um, <coughs> or buildings on the sliding hill um, UVM Medical Center properties on East Avenue remaining residential we would maintain our 150 foot transitional buffer, which Dave will explain when we get to some diagrams, and the density and height continues to be focused in the campus core. The key changes that we're um, seeking are adjusting the height overlay boundary, which we'll show you a diagram that really brings that to life, um, and increasing our maximum allowable height um, and this is above sea level, so all of you should have the water tower in your mind. It's not that we're going to build a building that's 580 feet tall, I promise, because I think that's 50, I just checked, that's 50 stories. Um, that would be really massive for Vermont. It's that we would be looking to go from 540 feet, which is the same level as the water tower, to up to 580 feet above sea level. And then, um, this is important, this is an estimate, but in order for us to be able to serve um, that many more inpatient beds, we would also need to expand our parking. This is both for families of patients as, and patients as well as some of our staff. Um, so the estimate here is up to about 2,900, but um, we are actually still in the process of studying this. So please note, that's an estimate. And then finally, looking to increase our lot coverage from 60%, what it, which is what it is currently, to what I would call a range of 65 to 70%. So Dave's going to tell you and explain these um, very exciting diagrams. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Karen. So essentially, uh, this is a diagram of the existing uh, campus. Uh, and you can see that uh, the left-hand side is to the north. Uh, Colchester Avenue. The top of the diagram is East Avenue. The areas uh, on the right-hand side are really the UVM campus. The, we are uh, approximately, I would say, 97% built out on the campus, and that's not impervious area or lot coverage, just our basic capacity. We have no ability to add any more square footage. 
uh, at currently. We, uh, our utility plan is at 100%. Uh, we're not able, and we're not anticipating expanding that, by the way, but uh, we are limited in terms of the amount of infrastructure we have on a campus. The campus, of course, was established in uh, 1879. The community grew up, it was, I don't know if it was a wilderness area, but it was out in the country. It's grown up since then, obviously. Uh, we, uh, the building development pattern is pretty consistent with what you see with the hospitals in New England. The first building was built in 1879, and then eventually over time, you got into the sprawling type of topography. Uh, the different colors that you see on the diagram, uh, Karen mentioned the, the 150 foot transitional buffer area. That is uh, bounded on uh, by East Avenue and Colchester. Those are areas where we want to limit the amount of density in building and uh, maintain it. Uh, currently, it's no more than 40% uh, lot coverage. We're going to continue that. Uh, the darker green area is really the main center of the campus. And you can see that there's some uh, other green spaces there. For example, the sledding hill that's in front of the Mary Fletcher building. Those are all protected areas. Uh, so the plan that we want to be able to develop is how do we uh, increase the, 400, the 242 additional inpatient beds? We know we can't add out and make the building a larger footprint. Our only ability to add the square footage capacity that we need is by going up. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in the next few slides. Okay. Uh, you see the colored patterns here really represent areas that we're looking at to see if we could create building envelopes to be able to su support our inpatient beds. They're not necessarily a building design. These are areas that we think we could develop uh, into uh, build future buildings that would support our inpatient needs. And just to, to sort the colors out for you, on the far right hand side you see the two blue rectangles. The lighter blue rectangle is a footprint for a garage that would replace the McClure garage that currently is on, on Colchester Avenue. The darker footprint is additional parking that would be added over time to support the development that we, we just described. The orange radial, a radius area at the bottom of the diagram, that represents the Miller Building. We're able currently, through the current zoning and the work that we did to plan for that building, add additional floors on that building. And we would intend to go back and do that at some point in the future. The brighter red portion is uh, on the Colchester Avenue. is pretty much in the area of where the McClure garage is currently. And if that garage is no longer there, we have the ability potentially to develop a building in that site. The inner part of the campus, we have a little brighter, I guess it's an orange uh, there. Uh, that would be a new inpatient building which would actually end up housing the most of our inpatient beds in the future. Now, uh, what we're faced with is that we, we cannot uh, you know, add on to the buildings. We basically have to tear something down to be able to create a replacement building, but to do that at, at, much, uh, at a higher elevation to give us the floor capacity that we need. So the only way we can expand on this campus is by tearing something down and building in the existing uh, footprint of that area. We're gonna get into the height overlay discussion. Uh, he, and Karen mentioned this in her part of the presentation. We have, uh, the current zoning allows us to have uh, build up to the top of the water tower at 540 feet, and that's a confusing number. Uh, that's really, is the plane the, of what that water tower that sits on the far right hand side of the drawing, if you extend that plane out over our campus, that's what we use as a reference point. It wasn't really our idea, that's what's in the zoning regulations currently. And we promised we'd work with uh, Megan's shop to figure out a better way to describe, describe that. Uh, but the lighter blue area is the current core overlay. We're allowed to build up to that 540 foot level uh, and that was actually implemented at the time that we uh, uh, did the zoning change for the Miller Building that enabled us to, to build the Miller Building. What we'll be proposing, not in the memorandum of understanding, but through a zoning ordinance change, would be to add that bright yellow area 
which would take that core overlay out and extend it to Mary Fletcher Drive. And there we want to add uh, another 40 feet to be able to go up uh, uh, beyond the height of the water tower up to, I think it's 580 feet. The area that's bounded on, uh, the red area that's bounded uh, there on Colchester Avenue, we're not going to be asking for any additional heights beyond what's already described in the current zoning regulations. So if we're able to do that, then we're able to develop, we believe, all of our inpatient beds on the Medical Center campus, which is a, which is a, is a, is a major priority for us. Uh, we, we are really trying to avoid creating another campus location outside of Burlington. Uh, so we need to develop strategies that would enable us to build on the campus, maximize our development capacity there, uh, so we can keep our beds in Burlington, which we really, which we want to do. Okay. Okay. Last slide with the, with the nice pictures. Uh, through, we've been in dialogue with our neighbors, uh, and one of the areas that was of concern is to make sure that we uh, provide enough of protection for the Mary Fletcher building. And what we're going to be proposing in the memorandum of understanding is pretty much uh, protecting that building into perpetuity in terms of its historical characteristics, its building materials, and so on, and leave that intact, and actually ensure that the view corridors that the, we have benefit of now from Colchester Avenue up to that building are maintained. So we are going to be quite sensitive in terms of how close we would build uh, to that building. And here's one uh, uh, <coughs> illustration of what we have, uh, we were planning. Uh, to basically make sure that we keep a sufficient buffer away from the building, allow the building to frame itself, uh, and make sure there's still a, a, a view corridor benefit for the city and, and everybody that drives by. Okay, so we thought this might be helpful for you as well, and I noted some of these things already. So um, this is our tentative timeline for updating the MOU. So we're here with you all tonight. Um, uh, by uh, mid, uh, this is mid-February, so let's just say mid to late February, so in the next week or so, um, that we would share our detailed markups of the MOU. So our attorneys have been working with the city attorney's office on this. So as soon as we have a version of that that we can share with you, we will do that. Um, in late February, we will be doing at the uh, council meeting on the 26th, we will be doing a public presentation um, uh, on our planning and the draft MOU. Then, as I, as I announced earlier, we're going to be holding a Q&A session on March 7th. And I just confirmed the location for that, and that was before I had made the slide. So we're going to be doing that actually at the hospital at the Mary Fletcher meeting room. And then finally, we're anticipating possible council action on the MOU in uh, late March. So here's what you can expect. There's going to be some perfunctory updates. We've had two amendments to the um, MOU. So those are going to get put into the same document. We will be restating our commitment to keep the city um, departments informed and coordinating on long range planning, which I think may tie into some of the other conversations that you all have been having. Um, we will continue to respect uh, and protect the Mary Fletcher building. Um, um, and we will be recognizing the long, long range planning goals of accommodating all of UVM Medical Center's acute care beds on this campus. Um, and also we would have language that provides for our ability to cooperate with developers if employee housing opportunities were to arise um, in Burlington and the adjacent um, towns. And then of course we'll have some very technical language in there that I have to trust Dave and the, um, and the attorneys for with respect to what we were describing, um, uh, uh, height overlay, campus density, and increased parking. Um, and so, um, again, just so that you all know, with the land use MOU, this sort of, in some ways, is like where we um, clear the path. But there are so many other opportunities to provide public input. What we showed you this evening was a conceptual rendering of what we might do. Um, as things develop, um, you can bet that there will be, you know, we'd be asking for zoning change requests. There would be um, changes to the JIPMIP, as I like to say, the Joint Institutional Parking Management Plan, um, Act 250 hearings, and then, of course, city permitting. 
All of these are opportunities for uh, residents to raise their hand, ask questions, share concerns, and that type of thing. So the MOU does not supersede any of those, but it's an important way for us to set the tone on how we work with you on our planning. And so that's it. <laughs> questions? Here at 908, sorry. Joel? Sure. Um, sure. So Burlington and uh, has, a, has a goal to reduce single car occupancy usage and vehicle miles traveled. Um, we've actually made some uh, bad progress. We've gone backwards in the past few years. Uh, COVID really set a number of things back. And so we, we were making progress for a while, and we've currently lost progress. Um, curious if you've got any plans to help Burlington meet this car usage goal. I, th I think the building of parking spaces will induce more car usage. As a Vermont State Walking College member, we went through a, a, a large history of walking and how to build good cities. Uh, in addition to reading books, Walkable City Rules and Cities for People by Jan Gell, as well as like YouTube channels of City Nerd, Not Just Bikes, uh, City Beautiful Strong Towns. Building parking is the just about the worst thing you can do to a town. So, and I know that we, we are in America and we're trapped in this cycle. It's very vicious. But I urge you to be creative and, and be, be, be tough on the parking because we, we got to get rid of the cars being driven everywhere. Uh, automobiles are the second leading cause of death for Americans, uh, non-medical causes of death, right behind guns. Go us. Um, we got to get the cars off the roads. It's, uh, they're finding 80% of people tested have microplastics in their blood. 70% of the microplastics found in water is car tires. So as a, as a health center, I think you'd be really interested in, in being as safe as you can and promoting a good, healthy environment. So I appreciate your work bringing jobs to the region, taking care of our sick folks. I'm going to get sick someday and need your help, absolutely. But please consider the car usage as a almost counterproductive to our goals um, as a region, as a, as a species, too. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll be, that'll be a very robust analysis. So we looking at all the transportation options that are available. The challenge that we're facing is trying to find the, the right balance. I mean, some of our patients come from 200 miles away. They're not served by uh, mass transit. Uh, and I think part of uh, the work that has to be done, and we look forward to working with the city and our regional partners, how do we make a much more robust transportation system that the underserved areas currently, uh, people can get to work uh, and come to you know, work and not rely on a single uh, passenger uh, automobile? The tricky part with that is uh, patients coming from as far away as Lake Ontario. How do they get here? Uh, we gotta make sure that the patients that are gonna be accessing our inpatient acute care beds have access. And we're hoping that over time, technology and just uh, the ability to develop robust transportation systems are going to ameliorate uh, the single occupancy vehicle. So we really uh, respect your opinion on that, and we'll be working to figure out how we balance correctly. Please do your best. Thank you. Um, I just have a question of why is this now all coming? And it has to be done by March. I mean, this is, I'm seeing a pattern here, and it's not just the hospital, it's the university, it's other things in this city. But all this stuff is coming together at one time, and it makes me very leery about why it's coming to us and with such short notice. I appreciate that point, and I think part of what we're trying to um, take advantage of is that the MOU expires late this year. Um, we actually have been um, slowly but surely meeting with neighbors. We have held two parking and traffic task force meetings with the neighbors who are um, uh, close to the area, and I've put that on front porch forum. So we actually have, this has not been our first opportunity to talk to neighbors. It has been our first opportunity to come to the MPA. But I do appreciate your point. There is a lot going on right now as we head towards, you know, a major transition for our city. So 
so I actually, uh, for, for you, there's a person who has her hand raised. Yeah. Now, hold on. We got, you've got a question, right? Okay, yeah. yes. Okay. Thank you. Just to call on that person. No, she didn't answer the question. Do you want you to answer the question? Okay, are we going to wait for the answer to that question? Or no, I can, no? Uh, okay. I, I think Karen responded to the process to date. Uh, the in terms of the, the timing for this, we've been working on trying to understand and forecast our inpatient bed needs for the past couple of years. Uh, as you may know, and I think we all know, is the UVM Medical Center is, is now the UVM Health Network's principal acute care hospital. It's a teaching hospital. It serves a wide geographic area. Uh, we are experiencing greater patient volumes, more than what was originally anticipated as as early as the 2000 census. When we constructed the Miller Building, we expected there would be a leveling off, potentially a decrease in overall in acute care inpatient beds. But in terms of what we've been learning through the, the 2020 census, and since then, that's not what happened. The, the best forecasters that were in existence at that time failed to recognize the growth patterns that were occurring in Vermont. So we found ourselves identifying a couple years ago that our need for inpatient beds were greatly uh, uh, outstripping our current capacity to handle those beds. So we're putting together a plan to be able to develop the needs to meet our inpatient care requirements as soon as we can. A key component of that is figuring out how do we take a look at the, the medical center campus and can we develop that in a way to host those beds. When we first started out, we said, I'm not sure we can do this. You know, we began looking at potential sites outside of Burlington for uh, expanding inpatient beds. The message that we got from the city and others was, no, if you can, we want you to stay in Burlington to build this in Burlington. Can you figure out how to come back with a plan that would enable that? And that's the work that we've been doing for the last couple of years and we started the conversations with our, our, our local neighbors a few months ago about what that might look like. And coinciding with that was the status of our memorandum of understanding, which was expiring. And we felt we had an obligation to update that document and to be able to develop with the city and the neighbors some parameters by which we could develop on the medical center campus to meet our inpatient needs. So that's kind of the general time frame uh, and how this came upon us up to this point. And I, I don't know if that's responsive to your question, but that's uh, the best way I can answer at this point. I still, I mean, my husband works up there. I know that place. I used to work up there years ago. And we just built that Miller Center. How long ago did that open? Three years ago? And you're saying that you can add other if you knew this, why, why didn't you build it higher at the time? Why now, three years later, are we all of a sudden having to have all these? We all knew, a lot of people knew that that wasn't enough, what you were building up there. And you, you put huge rooms in there that, that could have been a bit smaller and not single patient rooms mm -hmm. in it to fit more people. Plus, I also want to know where have we added beds? Have we done something about mental health up in that building? Because I think we cut way back, back maybe eight years ago or something. And we are now having a huge need, and there's never beds or any place when someone is really in acute need of spaces up there. Well, well up thank there. you. Uh, sounds like we need to do a much better job going forward to explain the rationale behind uh, the plan that we're doing and allow for public dialogue and opportunity to people to ask questions with a dedicated right amount of time to provide good answers to that. So mm -hmm. we do welcome that. I got a question. Just wait, 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 wait. I was, I was next. Yeah. I was next. I, I want a follow-on question. Hold on. <laughs> Are you the right people to talk about the, the things that Kathy brought up? 
Well, the, 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 the use is how the use of the hospital will evolve over time. Mm -hmm. Or are you the guy who's saying, if I have to add 240 beds, here's how I can do it? Yeah. Uh, both of those. We will, we, we'll, uh, it's, it's not me alone, obviously. We will we have involving uh, a number of folks internally and externally okay. will be able to provide that. So yes, uh, okay. we just will need to expand our team to provide more uh, comprehensive answers. Okay, Kathy. Catherine. Catherine. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine. That's okay. Um, okay, so I just want to say one thing, and then I have a question. So, as a resident of this area, I am in total overwhelm right now with all of the things going on and all of the requests. It's overwhelming, and. My biggest worry is that we're going to do things that we're going to regret, that we're going to build up and build out that we're going to regret, and it's going to cause more serious problems down the road. You know, we're trying to address a prob the housing problem. I get that. I totally get that. I, just, I don't know. I just have this nagging feeling that we're going about this in such a rush. And I'm not saying don't do it at all. I'm just saying <laughs> do it in a way where you're not shoving the problem someplace else that the next generation is going to really suffer from. And the other thing that along these lines is what are you going to do with all of the new staff that are going to come into the hospital? What's the housing? What's that? What? Say more about that then, please. Uh, I, we have a uh, workforce planning uh, that we're uh, deep, going to be deeply involved in as the plan begins to unfold. Uh, we are working right now to develop uh, employee housing. We are actually building some of that in, in South Burlington. Right. And we'd like to uh, have that same type of philosophy and arrangement in Burlington. And that's what our memorandum of understanding wants to reflect some of that. So we want to build with uh, developers more employee housing. Would you consider not building um, for the patients? And the, can you do those simultaneously? Can you take into consideration staff housing along with patient rooms? Not within the current campus currently, if we were to No, I know not in the she means, You mean concurrently planning both? Yes, oh, yes exactly. Yes. Concurrently Got planning yeah. for both. Yeah. Yes, we are, actually. Yeah. That's in progress. And um, Dave, I always think it's helpful for you to explain how many years out we're talking. Yeah. I wanted to try to take us back from the precipice of, uh, of urgency here. The plan that, uh, <laughs> that Karen laid out is multi-years. If you take a look at what the what the next steps are, the memorandum of understanding provides for a, a broad uh, parameters of the development. However, there are very significant and more elaborate planning processes and presentations that we'll be going forward with. The city zoning request changes, for example, will start with a much more granular description of what we're talking about. There'll be several public hearings that will be related to that. Uh, our joint institutional parking management plan, which we have to update, uh, will describe in greater detail the transportation management initiatives that we're going to include in terms of assumptions of going forward. We have uh, the city permitting process, the development review board and the uh, uh, design review board hearings, which will be public processes, which will get into very great detail and granularity of what we're talking about. So there's going to be, over the next few years, uh, many uh, venues which we'll be talking about what our plans are and moving forward to seek approval for that. Uh, in terms of the next 30 days or something, that information is not going to be uh, available at this point. What we're trying to do is come up with a basic framework that we can continue our planning uh, and really determine whether it's even possible to do our inpatient bed planning in Burlington. It may not be, uh, and that's what we're going to discover as we go through this process. Who asked you, when you said before that the city asked you to keep the beds in Burlington? Yes. They did. Who? 
Uh, the the city administration asked us if we could figure out a way to keep the beds in Burlington. And what was the reasoning behind that? It benefits Burlington um, to have the beds concentrated here. Honestly, if we were to move to another location, that would mean that we would be maintaining two hospitals, which increase patient costs. I, I would say this goes back almost to the Saunders administration. When we were thinking about moving uh, and developing out, uh, another campus location in Williston, there was a great deal of uh, concern about that, and uh, the city was opposed to that plan. And all the recent iterations of discussions we have with them, and not even recent, but over the time, was the city has recognized the importance of uh, maintaining the medical center in Burlington. Yeah, Richard. Here you go, Richard. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks for the presentation. Dave, good to see you again. Um, can I put some of this in a, di in a slightly fr frame some of the same concerns in a different way? Um, over the past, I think, three or four months, and obviously it's accelerated recently, we've heard about um, the changes to the McNeil plant and the possibility of um, uh, sending uh, hot steam to heat the, uh, heat the uh, hospital right through Ward 1. Uh, now, that may not happen, but it's in place to happen. Um, we've got the memorandum of understanding um, with the university. For some reason, that also has to be signed off uh, by the end of this mayor's administration. That is going to affect Ward 1. About 90% of it will be in Ward 1. Megan gave a great presentation about the changes to zoning that affects Ward 1 significantly. That has to be signed off, as I understand it, in this, in this mayor's administration. And now, now some of these may not happen, because that's what you tell us. But everything has to be signed. So I suggest that the thing that doesn't, shouldn't happen is any of these things should be signed off. Everything should go wait to a new administration. The reason for the urgency is because this mayor has been a catastrophic failure. He hasn't generated the revenues to sustain the city, and we're in deep, deep trouble. And nothing should be signed off in this administration. Thank you. Kick all the cans. Hi. Yeah, so Kathy, I really appreciate you bringing up uh, the palatial nature of the Miller wing. Um, I was there for some surgery. Um, it was really magnificent. And I was in a single room, and I was walking basically into my own apartment for a couple of evenings, and there was a separate bed for Peter to be able to be in it. I mean, I'm just, as you speak, remembering it. And at the time, I felt, wow, look what's available to us. And I was very comfortable, very good service. So now I'm thinking, is there a way that you can look, for example, at that wing? And I don't know if it could happen with modular walls. I mean, we're not obviously going to totally renovate the thing. But it is palatial. And it's wonderful on the one hand. But compared to the impact on our neighborhood, and particularly appreciate the traffic mention, um, what are those possibilities? Have you considered that? Uh, the Miller uh, inpatient building patient rooms are built to a current contemporary standard that's uh, and it's currently being used uh, across the nation. Uh, the goals and objectives of the Miller building patient rooms were to be able to treat very highly acute uh, patients. 
and to be able to accommodate their families, many of which are traveling from far away. Uh, the other thing that the goal was to do is to create enough room in the space in the room to, for physical therapy to come, for them to bring treatment and diagnostic equipment into the room. So they're doing radiology uh, studies, uh, they're, uh, and a number of other uh, treatment uh, modalities that are happening within the room. We tried to build uh, the inpatient rooms to a uniform standard. Uh, they are built to meet the current code requirements. Uh, dual uh, occupancy rooms or semi-private rooms are not permitted uh, in, in the code. You can't do that. You need to build single rooms. So we think the Miller Building represents the best practice in terms of creating an environment that's conducive to healing, but enables providers and caregivers the room and the space they need to bring the care around the patient for the most part, as opposed to the patient having to be moved around to different areas within the hospital. Uh, we have a very high degree of satisfaction uh, of patients uh, utilizing the Miller Building, and that's a model that we would like to continue uh, to pursue if we build uh, new inpatient beds. So thank you for that, and all of that was true, and mine was an acute emergency situation. And all of those services were received. But what's happening for me this evening is thinking about all the people who are unhoused, looking for housing. You know, it could have been four people sharing that as an apartment. I mean, I, I really felt that way if we added a, you know, kitchen in there. So I, you know, on the one hand, I really tremendously appreciate it. And on the other hand, I have a new set of questions in my head. 340 square feet, put a number to it. The what? 340 square feet, each of those rooms from their website. That's the whole apartment that would be <laughs> Do we have other, uh, do we have somebody online? Who do we have? Sophie? Yes, are you planning to uh, take the doctor's offices and send them all to Tilly Drive or somewhere else? Uh, the campus has, uh, you know, basically a finite amount of space, yeah, even in, in we're talking development. As outpatient services grow, we don't have the capacity to house them all on the medical center campus. Most recently, uh, we've developed a, a building at Tilly Drive to host our dermatology and ophthalmology uh, clinical practices, some of which are within on the medical center campus and in other locations. So yes, we, we're not planning on growing or expanding uh, additional ambulatory services on the medical center campuses. Those, there's just not enough room for that. So as those uh, volumes and patient care needs increase, we'll likely have to develop other sites for those to occur. Okay, Sophie? Thank you. All right, and uh, Jean? Yes, I, I wrote the question in the Q&A, um, but it's concerned me. You don't have to answer this tonight, but I'm just wondering if you've thought about putting the helicopter pad on top of the new building. I'm always concerned about an emergency, you know, with a patient having to be transported from the helicopter pad up to the hospital. Yes, we've discussed that and we're looking at ways to integrate that into the planning. Oh, good. And uh, Cyril? Um, yes, actually, Jean just broke my mind. I was just going <laughs> to, I believe I've mentioned to Karen before the possibility of um, using the beta technologies, you know, the electric helicopters, if they might land on the Miller building. And it sounds like with new construction, what Dave just said, you're looking into it, and it might be a, a possibility in five or ten years. I'm not, uh, I'm not. A from an aviation perspective, I'm uncertain about the electric helicopter, but uh, <laughs> we would want to integrate uh, helicopter landing capability in our in our plan. Yeah, so Beta has a, I don't know if you call it the Veritol, or they can shift the motor to make it 
essentially like yeah, a helicopter. It. They go st straight up and across. But yeah, I think it would be great to have the beta, which is such a new, close at home industry, integrated with the hospital in terms of the new helipad. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I, I've got a just a quick question. You are are you working with the university and are familiar with their building plans? Yes, we coordinate with the university in terms of uh, not they, all they, of their building plans. Because they have some plans that could impinge on where the helicopters land now. <laughs> we've, we've, okay. we're aware of those. Okay. Um, uh, Just to quickly underscore Cyril's point, um, I, uh, in a former job, had the uh, privilege of uh, taking a little uh, test flight um, um, with uh, Beta. And uh, one of the things that they're doing is they are uh, really working on um, organ, uh, uh, transporting organ uh, replacement and other medical uh, supplies. So I really just want to underscore what Cyril's saying. Um, Y'all ought to talk to Beta because um, they're the wave of the future. Um, and their whole design is that they can land in the same area that a helicopter can land, uh, basically. Um, and they're looking to serve rural communities all over the country. Thanks. Tom? Yes. Is there a way, like, do you have the information of this or, like, pictures of the side view? You're talking about the height of stuff. Do you have any illustrations we can look up? Not yet. We're uh, going to be working on those uh, as we go forward with our uh, zoning changes and such. Okay, I think uh, if there's no other questions, there's one more question. I do want to say that line at the end that says if you don't get the zoning by a date certain, if the whole MOU goes away, is a poison pill. And it's yeah. like taking hostages. And I'd yeah. like you to make a commitment as soon as possible that you're going to take that out because it also says we don't trust the city to be a partner and get this done in time. Yeah. But there's yeah. a whole yeah. slide yes. here of all the wonderful opportunities that are in the MOU that are committed. Right. right. And they Jeannie, yeah, and just to be clear, we would keep those agreements in there. That was referring to the the building development. Do I have, am I saying Cor that correctly, correct. Dave? Yeah. So, uh, I agree with you, Jeannie. That was an that was an error in our last PowerPoint that we're correcting, and okay, thank you. yes, and we'll address. Yeah. All right. I thank think you. Our meeting is over. Thank you very much.